Good morning, everyone. We're, uh, it's getting to be about that time, so we're going to go ahead and get started. And um, everyone can continue to filter in at your leisure. But we are going to start off this morning reading Psalm 14. Psalm 14, verses 1 through 7. Verse 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They all, they have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge? All the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord. There they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. Will you pray with me, please? Father, this is all about you. Lord, take us out of the equation this morning. Help us to see you for who you really are. Lord, prepare our hearts for, for true, genuine worship this morning. Help us to understand why we're here and what we're doing. And Lord, speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Bibles and open them to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1. And if you get nothing out of this worship service today, I want you to know that it's not a religion, it's a relationship. Amen? Amen. We can start in verse 18 about the announcement of the birth of the Savior. Now the birth of Jesus Christ is as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, desired, desi decided to put her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place that the, what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall be, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated God with us. And Joseph arose from his sleep, and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took her as his wife, and kept her a virgin until she gave birth to the son, and they called his name Jesus. May God bless the reading of his word. Father, I thank you so much for all that you've given us. Uh, but especially the greatest gift of all, which is our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, hearts will be opened, minds will be opened, so that you might change and direct each as your Holy Spirit does. We ask that you be glorified above and beyond everything. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Will you please stand? Amen. 
Anticipation grows within us. There is no war, no division in the world that is beyond your capacity to heal. There is no hatred in the cosmos that cannot be transformed by your forgiving love. There is no social ill, relational breach, nor systematic evil that will not dissolve at your touch. In this third week of Advent, we sing with the prophets. In this third week of Advent, we shout with the children. In this third week of Advent, we pray with believers around the world. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father God in heaven, as we come before your throne, we humble our hearts and we ask, Lord, that in this year of 2020, as we approach the great day that we celebrate as Christmas, Father, that you will do a work that's never been done before. Lord, that you will work in our hearts and show us, Father, how we can present Christmas to a world that is hurt, that's broken, that screaming, Heavenly Father, for someone to show them Christ. Help us, Heavenly Father, to present it in such a way, Lord, that they could see Christ and not us. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that they would see it through First Baptist Church of Inverness. Father, through the way that we love and the way that we give, we pray, Heavenly Father, that we would honor you in our worship today. We pray, Father, today that it would please you and so we ask, Father, today as we offer the sacrifice of praise, Lord, that it would touch your ears and bring a smile to your face. And so, Lord Jesus, we give these things to you. In Christ's name we ask, amen. <laughs>
to do this morning, and um, we've been talking about how we love, invest, and serve one another, and that's really the heartbeat of, of what, why we do what we do here at First Baptist, and, and that's why we've been um, 
doing the announcements the way we've been doing because we really just want to explain to everybody why we're doing what we're doing and, um, and why we do announcements and so that everybody can know what God is doing uh, amongst this body of believers. So the first announcement we have this morning is we have Upward Soccer coming up in January. And um, this is not just a, a children's department thing or, or an outreach thing. This is a, a, an entire... Uh, church body community um, thing that we have going on here at First Baptist, we need everyone involved. And by saying that, I mean uh, we need people to be there on Saturday mornings to, um, to, to go around and talk to people and to just to establish relationships with the parents of the kids. There's going to be lots of kids playing in this soccer league that, that don't go to church anywhere. And um, and, and, and not that we're trying to get them to come to church, but we're trying to get them to know Christ. And, and that's the most um, important thing uh, about Upward Soccer is that these kids are going to hear the gospel a lot of times for the first time. And they're going to get to see it over a, a long period of time. They're going to get to see it um, uh, lived out in the lives of the coaches and, and hopefully uh, the director, which is me. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's a great opportunity to, to establish some, some long-term relationships uh, with some kids and their families. So um, if you're interested, uh, I believe next week after church we're going to have a meeting so you can see what's, what, what that entails, what it means to be a volunteer at Upward. Uh, we have all kinds of, of positions. You could be a referee. You could be a coach. You could be working at the concession stand. Um, you could just be somebody that walks around and talks to parents in, in the crowd. So um, if, you, if you're if you interested in that, stay after church next week and we'll talk more. So um, Another thing that's going on this time of year is the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Our goal as a church this year is $9,999.99. And I believe Pastor Byron said that he was going to uh, auction off or have a bidding war for that extra penny to put us over the $10,000 mark. So um, you can just uh, dedicate that on your, your slip when you uh, put your, your tithes and offerings in the box. So um, we also need still, still need help passing out lunches on Mondays and Thursdays from 12.15 to 1.15. Um, that is something that I think I'm 95% I'm sure it's going to continue throughout the rest of the school year. So. Um, they, they still haven't decided 100% whether that's going to happen or not, but I believe that's, that's the way they're leaning. So if you're interested, and what a great way, guys. This has been the, almost the entire school year that we've been as a church in the schools um, as a, as a, to be a light to help to fill a need. And um, it's not only filling a need, but it's, it's building relationships with people in the community uh, maybe that are not, are not a part of our body. So it's just a, it's a great way to get involved in our community. Um, we also have food delivery on Mondays. So um, if, if you, you, you want to be a part of that ministry, please talk to me. Um, if you are a visitor today, um, we would like you to come up front on stage. And no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, if you're a visitor, uh, we, we typically have cards in the back of the pews that we, we ask you to fill out just so that we can uh, reach out and say thanks for coming thanks for joining us this morning um, if you don't want to fill out a card at least just tell somebody hey this is my first time here this is the first uh, this is I'm visiting today and, uh, and let somebody know so that we can uh, make you feel welcome and, and thank you for coming so all right I think that's it for the announcements today oh one more the mailboxes are full again just like normal so this time of year the mailboxes get overflowing and um, I was talking in the earlier service about how to make that a worshipful announcement, and it's because we love each other so much. There's so much love here that we just want to tell each other, and the, the Christmas card, or the Christmas cards in the mailboxes overflow with love. So, yeah, clean them out. <laughs> um, all right, are you ready for the question? All right, so we are on week 50. 52 weeks, we're on week 50, so two more weeks, we're almost there. So this is a, a great one this week. Um, the question is, what does Christ's resurrection mean for us? The answer, 
is Christ triumphed over sin and death by being physically resurrected so that all who trust in him are raised to new life in this world and to everlasting life in the world to come. Just as we will one day be resurrected, so this world will one day be restored. But those who do not trust in Christ will be raised to everlasting death. And they get that um, catechism answer from the scripture, and that comes from 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, and 14. It says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Amen. Stand as we sing. It's a, uh, don't do that to me yet. <laughs> when we started with Advent this morning, I don't know if y'all felt it, but it's just around the corner. It's just around the corner, and it's not the anticipation of, of stuff. It's, for me, and the butterflies that I had this morning, which are certainly welcome, is the king is coming. And it's the obligatory December 25th, the day that, that we picked, is the day when we celebrate the birth of our Savior, how amazing and awesome it is to celebrate this time of year for a Savior who came to save somebody as lowly as me, and no offense, but somebody as lowly as y'all, he reaches out to the lowest of the low, to the highest of the high, bringing salvation to his people. That's what he came for. Remember that as we celebrate the Christmas season.
hallelujah to the highest name of all. Father, we take great pride in who we are and our names and all the trappings of our lives, and we forget to say, hallelujah, hallelujah, to the highest name of all. Bless Dallas as he brings that word from you this morning, Father God. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. <clears throat> Merry Christmas. We all experience pretty much the same things in life. Um, we kind of consider them as a normal part of the life experience. We go through childhood and adolescence. Um, we go through school, maybe go on to formal schooling afterwards. We uh, get married, we have a, a, a career, we retire, and then we die. No, that's not depressing. That's life. But it's just, it's just pretty much all normal. It varies a little bit here and there, but we go, all go through that, that process. But the one process that sticks out always, in, in, at least in my mind, and I think most everybody else's, is the birth, is the beginning. Um, the birth of my first child was far from normal. First of all, she was born breech. And uh, secondly, uh, our family doctor said that I experienced a sympathetic pregnancy along with my wife. I gained 20 pounds, I wore baggy clothes, um, I had mood swings, um, but when it came time to actually experience the pain, uh, I ignored that, I didn't go that far. But I was in the room and I saw the baby born and it, it brought tears to my eyes. It, uh, we had to have another one right away. I mean, she, from the beginning, she slept all night. It was just wonderful. So we had another one, and he had colic for five months. Um, so we, we decided to end it, end it, uh, end it there. Um, you know, when you see a normal family, it's uh, perhaps two, three, four. If you get up into the six, seven range, we consider that kind of a large family. Um, in the 1700s, there was one lady who was pregnant 27 times, and she had 69 children. She was from Russia. She had 16 pair of twins, seven sets of triplets, and four sets of quads. God bless her. Uh, multiple births have also been common in the past couple of decades. We all remember um, what was her name? Octomom, uh, the one with eight. Uh, but there was also, the, the largest one was in 1971, where she had decatuplets. That's ten. And they all lived. Uh, we see most babies born between six and nine pounds. My, my two were a little bit under five pounds. Uh, but the record is 22 pounds for yeah, I hear a lot of sighs out there from the women. But also, the tiniest baby ever born to live weighed 8.6 ounces and was 9 inches long. She left the hospital at uh, 5 pounds, and she's... I tried to look her up again because I, I, I looked this up many years ago, but uh, I couldn't find her, but they said she's still living. Um, unusual births fascinate us, too especially Siamese twins. There was a pair of Siamese twin boys uh, back in the uh, early 1800s and uh, from Yugoslavia and that, in that area. Uh, and of course, they didn't have the technology then to separate them. So they grew up, and when they became older, they joined a traveling show, uh, and it came to America, and they eventually left the show, and they settled in North Carolina, and they married twin sisters. And the one twin had 10 children, and the other twin had 12 children. <laughs> and they all lived in the same house. And uh, today, they said, 
uh, that there's over 1,500 descendants living in that general area from those, from those two. Um, the youngest mother ever to give birth was five years and five and three quarter years old. And the oldest mother ever to give birth, they say, was 69 years old. But we know that's false. Because the oldest mother ever to give birth was 90. Her name was Sarah. And her husband was 100. And you can imagine what he thought <laughs> when Isaac said, hey, Dad, let's race. <laughs> oh, truly, the birth of a child is a miracle. We all say it is. And if you've witnessed one or two, like I have, uh, you know it is. The virgin birth of our Savior is so important to our faith because if there's any way possible it could be refuted, it would tear the whole system down. We might as well lock the doors. Um, but it deals not just with the miracle of the birth, but specifically the condition that has existed since the beginning of creation. And that condition is sin. And that is what the birth of the Savior is all about. And we can't forget that. As much as, you know, I, I love Christmas. I've always loved Christmas. In my business up north, I had for 15 years, um, it was a cabinet woodworking business. I used to put out roughly 10 to 15,000 lights around the building. I had a nice Amish, Amish uh, cart with a um, statue horse in front of it, and I used to do the lights on the wheels so it looked like they were turning. It was, I had so much fun doing that. But it's so much more than that. The day of Christmas should be not just a happy and glorious day, not just a day of opening the presents and giving gifts, but a remembrance of what it's all about. Because Christmas without Golgotha, without Calvary, is nothing has no meaning. It's just, a, it's just a jingle bell day. We need to keep and remember that. And I want to get into that for a little bit. So I want to get out of the Old Testament, and I want to go back to the New Testament. I want to go back to uh, the Psalms. Psalm 51, to be exact. I'm sure you're familiar with it. King David had committed adultery and if that wasn't enough, then he committed murder. And if that wasn't enough, then he committed hypocrisy. And one day, uh, the prophet Nathan came and he pointed his bony finger at David and said, you're the man, you're the one. And David at that point fell on his face and confessed and dealt with his sin. Psalm 51, I'll read verses 2 through uh, 6. In the New Living Translation, Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. And you will be proved right in what you say. And your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment of my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Now, verse 5 could be read as if the act was sinful. But if you were to look at the Amplified Bible, it would say, Behold, I was brought forth in a state of iniquity. My mother was sinful who conceived me, and I too now am sinful. In order to understand the reasoning for the virgin birth, we need to look at the sinful state of mankind. And I, I, tried, to under, I tried to come up with some type of an illustration uh, to help you understand this. And actually, I came up with a, an illustration from my own background. Um, my mother and my stepfather, when they got married, they had a son, uh, my half-brother. His name is Michael John. And my, my mom and my stepfather and myself, we all have a gene called PKU. It's a word that's about 15 letters long. And it, it 
The word is uh, phenylketonemia. And what it does is that gene attacks the enzyme that is supposed to distribute uh, the protein throughout the body. And it kills it. And what it did for my half-brother was he was basically high on protein for the first three years of his life. Um, there was brain damage, but uh, he's come a long way. He, he drives a, a truck. He rides his bike. He lives by himself with my sister next door, and he's born again. So God works miracles all around. But uh, it's rare. There's 87 million people born each year around the world. Well, that was six, seven years ago. I imagine that's a lot more. But there's only 20,000 cases a year of this. And the key is the mother and the father both have to have that PKU gene in order for the son or the daughter to have it attack them. Now, Michael John, he was one of the first. In fact, after his... Um, diagnosis, it is now a law throughout the land that every baby who is born has to be tested for PKU because they can correct it right there and there'll be no problems. But if only one, like I, if I had, I do have the PKU gene, but if my spouse does not, there's no problem. There'll never be a problem. That's the same issue with sin. The only problem is nobody in the history of the world has ever not had the sin gene. Everybody does. If you could look at the biology of a child being conceived in the womb, you would see your sinfulness be handed down to your newborn. Anybody here ever had to teach their children the word mine, mine? Did you ever have to teach your child to take his sibling's toy? Did you ever have to teach your child that when he does something wrong and you say, did you do that? Just say, no, I didn't do it. No, that's, that's in your gene. And we grow up with that. Um, that disease, nothing can be done. Science, you know, can, they can regulate the gene pool. You can, you want a blonde or you want a blue-eyed, they're, they're doing that now, but you can never, you can never get rid of the condition called sin. Paul wrote in Romans 5, or Romans 12, Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men. We are sinners by choice, we are sinners by nature, and we are sinners by birth. Psalm 58, a um, few verses down from uh, um, David, uh, David's confession, he said, the wicked are estranged from the womb. These who speak lies go astray from the birth, from birth, from the womb. Th that's not what I thought when I was holding my baby girl. I was holding my baby girl and I was, I saw the innocence, the brand, the brand newness of this life. Just hours before it, it was born. In fact, that thought um, I, I became determined that she was not going to turn out like me and what I'd experienced. And because of that determination, it led me to accept Christ as my Savior, eventually. But I, I can't deny, I can't deny that she's a sinner. I can't deny that there is a problem, not only with her, but with the whole human race. Now, what's the answer? How does God deal with something like that? I mean, where are you going to find a sinless person to become Mary's husband so they could have a problem? They could deal with it. They can't. 
There's no way. Well, what God could have done is he could have picked a godly husband like Joseph and a godly woman like Mary to bear a godly son. Okay, but all you have is humanity. You don't have any deity. Well, then what he could have done is he could have picked a godly uh, husband like Joseph and a godly wife like Mary, and at the fullness of time, they could have, he could have dropped a sinless baby on the doorstep. Okay, well, you've got, you, you've got deity, but you don't have humanity. Well, what he could have done is he could have gotten a godly father like Joseph, godly wife like Mary, and at the proper time inserted the spirit of Jesus into that boy. Well, you'd have deity and you'd have humanity, but it would be normal. You'd have two beings living in one body. So how does, how does it happen? God had to insert something that did not have the sin gene. And that could only be God himself. I want to go back one more time to Isaiah 7, starting in verse 10. Here's the context. Ahaz is the king of the southern, southern Israel, and he knows that the northern Israel is going bye-bye. Babylon, Babylon's coming for him, and he's not far behind. And he's concerned about the Davidic line because he's going to die. All his family's going to die. So what can he do? Well, the prophet Isaiah visits him, and the prophet Isaiah, through the Lord, the Lord through prophet Isaiah says, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, ask for a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it as deep as Sheol, or as high as heaven. Put, the God, put God to the test. That's a great offer. Uh, anything you want. Make the sun stand still. You know, whatever. And uh, in a moment of piety, Ahaz said, no, I won't do that. Well, God says, okay, fine. I'll provide my own miracle, since you won't ask. I will show you that the Davidic line will continue. In verse 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. This is perhaps the stormiest word, the stormiest verse in the entire Old Testament. And it has been argued by so many scholars because a, a number of the translations translate that as young woman and not virgin. But where's the miracle? How do you, <coughs> how do you have a miracle if it's just a young woman? How do you know it? How, how do you know it's the right one? Where's the miracle? Where's the spectacularness of it? Well, you have to understand the way the words that they used translated. The word in the Hebrew is Alma, A-L-M-A-H. And it comes from a verb, alav, A-L-A-M. And it means to hide or to cover up. Now the antonym or the opposite of alam is gala, G-A-L-A-H. And it means to uncover. And it's normally used in the Old Testament to remove clothing and show your nakedness. Now in the third century, when they were translating the Hebrew uh, Bible into the Greek, which was the Septuagint, they used one word. And that word was parthenos, virgin. Now, by nature, I'm a very logical person. But when I read Isaiah 7, 14, the arguments against the word Alma and not the rest of the passage, how do you know? How, where's the miracle? If this is going to be 800 years in the future, how will you know? The only way you could know is if it was, if it was the miracle birth of a sinless child from a virgin. Okay, let's jump 800 years in the future. Luke 1, 26. 
It's the story of Gabriel. Now a man and a Parthenos, a virgin, were going about their daily lives totally unaware of what God had in store for them. And we join the story as Gabriel enters. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be, or betrothed, to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Now that doesn't mean she's sinless, okay? But God's hand was upon her for a very special purpose. Now just imagine, just for a, just for a moment, a 15 or 16 year old girl the plans that she had. She's betrothed to this wonderful man, Joseph. He's got his own business. He's a carpenter. She's thinking about all of the, she's got a wedding coming up. She is, um, I'm sure, thinking about the house that they're going to live in, what they're going to do, the adventures, the children, all the happiness. And all of a sudden, on that one day, that book of Mary goes like this. And God goes like this with a brand new book. And Mary just says, be it as you want, Lord, I'm yours. Wow. That's, that's almost incomprehensible. Now, verse 31 and 32, the announcement, look at Mary's response. Mary said to the angel, how could this be since I am a Parthenos? How can this be because I'm a virgin? And he now 800 years, declares the miracle that God promised. The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, this holy child shall be called the Son of God. Interesting. He will not become the Son of God. He will be called the Son of God. There's two words that are really important in this passage. The first one is holy. For the first time, the very first time since creation, we have a holy, which interpreted to mean sinless, we have a sinless individual being born into our sinful world. By a miracle. One able scholar wrote, from the production of the egg out of Mary's ovary, to the actual birth, the fetal state in Mary's womb was under the protection and controlling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Under his care, there was protection from miscarriage as well as from birth defects. That child was totally protected from day one until the ninth month. Now we have a dilemma. And nothing's ever said in Scripture, which, which always blows my mind. They never say anything about Mary having to tell Joseph. They never, I would have loved to have been a fly in a wall in that room to hear what went on. But he loved her. He loved her very much. And he could have disgraced her, and not only that, had her stoned to death. But that's not who he was. Now this happens, when the betrothal happens, it's usually done by the parents. And it'll last a year, just in case the lady's been fooling around, the pregnancy will become evident and the whole thing can be dissolved. But that wasn't the case. Um, you'll find very few Bible lessons or Sunday school lessons about that in between 18, verse 1, 18 and 19. Uh, but he had a decision to make. So why does Joseph, not wanting to disgrace Mary, why does that make him righteous? Well, he, he, he had his legal rights to humiliate her and stone her. What does righteousness have to do with that? Well, he loved this lady. He, he loved her very much. It was an agape love. And that's, it's proven by what he does. He wanted to put her away silently, not just make this go away. He sincerely cared. And what it said that he, um, 
he considered this. The actual, we don't really have a, a single word translation, but a sentence would be, he came to terms with it. He came to terms with it. He wasn't going to do this, even though he could. And I'm sure he had in his mind, revenge is mine, saith the Lord. We'd all be well off to consider that in our own lives. But he didn't. Um, when he considered it, he made up his mind and he went to sleep. And that's Matthew 1, 20 through 23 comes into effect. But when he had considered this, when he had come to terms with this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Behold, the virgin Parthenos shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which translated mean God with us. When, when the Spirit led Matthew to write these words, he told him specifically to use the word Parthenos. You know what I love about Joseph? He arose that very morning and he went and did it. He, I mean, I take it to mean he went that very day and had it done. And not only that, but he waited nine months before he can cons consummated the marriage. Good for you, Joseph. Good for you. The angel didn't tell him he had to do that. He did that on his own. Now, there's a righteous and humble man. The virgin birth uh, has always been and will always be a battleground for theologues. Disprove it and everything falls apart. But to uphold the virgin birth means that we have a perfect sacrifice which has destroyed the chain that has held us down. That chain that holds us down, the sin of the world. Later on, you know, nowhere in the New Testament in the uh, letters from Acts through Revelation does it mention the virgin birth? It does allude to it. We've had some great creeds over the years. In AD 375, there was the Nicene Creed. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary. The Council of Chalcedon in AD 451, truly God, truly man of the Virgin Mary. And the Apostles' Creed in the 5th century, I believe in Jesus Christ, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born in the Virgin Mary. And of course, we're familiar with the Westminster Short Catechism. Christ is the Son of God, became man, being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary. But there's also the oldest confession, the oldest confession in the world, 1 Timothy 3.16. He who was re revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up into glory. He who was revealed in the flesh is Jesus' birth. He who was vindicated in the spirit is his resurrection and taken up in glory. That's the Savior's ascension. And some have taken this and they've gone the complete opposite. Jesus was a superhero. You know, arrows and spears bounced off his chest. And, no, no. He was a God-man. But he was a man. It was a normal birth. It was a conception that was a miracle. He took his first breath. He cried. I'm sure he peed all over Joseph at least once. Um... Everything was normal. Okay, of course there's, you can't have a miracle happening without someone expounding on it. Like, 
a miracle isn't enough. They have the, I don't know if you've ever read any of the, I love reading some of the apocryphal gospels. Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Jude, the Gospel of Judas, Gospel of Peter. Um, they talk about uh, Jesus being born and um, the, they had a, some, some say he had a midwife and he, she was cured of palsy. Uh, when the wise men came, when he was two, he sat up in his bed and he said, I am Jesus, the Son of God. I am the Logos. I come here to save the world at two years old. No, Jesus was a miracle from the beginning, a true baby. In fact, if, if you were to walk into a nursery, if there was a nursery back then, you couldn't pick out Jesus. That's how normal he was. There was no thing around his head. So what? So what? So everything. Here's a few things that are absolutely significant because of the virgin birth. God cared enough to protect the sinlessness of his son. The holiness was so important to him. Holiness is not something that we hear a lot about. We hear a lot about tolerance. We need to tolerate things. We need to... We, we need to um, be understanding about people of other faith and no the church has become way too tolerant you don't hear enough in fact you hear very seldom even in Christian churches the words be holy even as I am holy that's what God said he didn't say be good do your best he said be holy as I am holy. Be like me. Impossible? Yes. But not on a day-to-day -day basis. Since deity became humanity, Christ knows what we go through. He understands everything we experience. You will never see Jesus sitting on the edge of heaven looking down at the problem you're going through and saying, I can't imagine what that's all about. He can because he knows and he is an empath. He, if he, he has put his arms around me so many times in my life He's also done one of these to me, too. But that's who he is. I'm not a huge fan of poetry, but I come across a short one from Frank Graff that I wanted to share as I close. Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deep for myth or song? As the burdens press and the cares distress, and the days grow weary and long. Does Jesus care when my way is dark with nameless dread and fear? As the daylight fades into deep night shades, does he care enough to be here? Does Jesus care when I have tried and failed to resist some temptation strong? When my deep grief I find no relief, though my tears flow, all night long. Does Jesus care when I've said goodbye to the dearest one of mine and my sad heart aches till it nearly breaks? Is it aught to him? Does he see? Does he mind? Ah, yes. He cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the day is weary and the long night dreary, I know my Savior cares. We're in a season, a wonderful season. And as we talk to friends and relatives, and it, it'll always come up. What would you like for Christmas? What, what would you like for Christmas? I want to encourage you today. And I'd be 
I think I would be correct in saying there's probably very few in this church right now. Whoever in their quiet time had a knee on the floor and said, Lord, what would you like for Christmas? What would you like? And if you listen closely, you would hear him say, give me yourself. Give me your life. Give me your hopes and dreams, your frustrations, your temptations, your ills, your woes. And in doing so, I will break the chain of sin that ties you down. And I will give you a life of new direction. And all you need do is one thing. Change your mind. And invite my son inside. The word repent has, um, has a connotation of um, ill will toward people. And it's not. It's actually a military term. And all it means is about face. That's all it means. All of you have heard the scripture about the wide road and the narrow road. It's the same road. All you're doing in this crowded road going to hell, all you're doing is turning around and walking the other way, which is difficult. Try walking up a down escalator during Christmas time. That's exactly what it is. But you want to see how easy it is? You want to know how easy it is? How easy it is. Lord God, I'm, I'm in deep, dire straits. I have a lot of problems in my life. I've done a lot of bad things, and I've done some good things, but I have no direction. I need direction in my life. And I saw in your word, it said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, and I will live with him. And Lord Jesus, I'm praying right now that you will come into my life and change it for your good and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. That's it. That's all it takes. Anywhere, anytime. As the musicians come forward, I want to give you an opportunity. Let's all stand. And we'll do it right here. Everybody with your head bowed, eyes closed, we'll all do it right here with a heart of thanksgiving, with a heart of rejoicing at a time that we're going through this Christmas season. Right now, just simply from your heart, Lord, what do you want from, for Christmas? What can I give you for Christmas this year? A little tiny thing? Something that will last for a long, long time? If you pray that prayer to your Savior, he will show you, he will tell you, and then you need to look for it and find it. Perhaps there is no one here who has never accepted Christ as a Savior. If that's the case, praise God. But where is your life with your Savior? If you have frustrations, temptations, ills, wills, He's there to help. The altar is open. All you need to do is come forward. People will pray with you. I will pray with you. And you can start from there. Father, I thank you so much for your message this morning, for your word. I pray that you will be glorified in every decision made here today, no matter how small or large. To those who are hurting, Lord, give them that, that lovely and warm arm around them. And let them know that you're near. And be glorified in this Christmas season in all of life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The altar is open.
you for your spirit. Thank you for your presence here this morning. Thank you for the baby. Come, let us adore him. As you came in, you should have grabbed a piece of paper if you're a church member. Just a small piece of business that we have to finish up towards the year end. We needed to vote on a budget and nominating committee. Hopefully you grabbed one of those on your way and put it in the basket. If you didn't, grab one on the way out. It's a quick uh, check of the box. Uh, if you would be so kind as to do that as the year end draws to a close. Thank you all for attending this morning. And do be careful as you go to your individual homes. But proclaim the word of Christ in everything that you do. And take care. <laughs>